welcome back to my channel, everyone. Today we are going to be talking about something a little bit more somber. Something that I believe I can bring awareness to and something that needs to change. Because change has to happen. And it starts today with my story. For those of you who don't know, on August 17th of 2020, I was in a horrific car accident that resulted in multiple broken places in my spine, a broken neck, it's left me wheelchair bound, and I am lucky to have left with my life that day. That being said, the life that I lived and loved is no more. The life that I live now is vastly different from anything I would have ever chosen for myself through no fault of my own. And today we are going to talk about the sentencing for the man who caused my accident. And the court process, everything leading up to the court day, what happened in court, and the aftermath of that. And this is a call to our province to help make change with me. Because change needs to happen. I believe that we owe the victims of car accidents much more than what they're given. And I believe that we can do this together and we can make change. And maybe it is because there's a lack of awareness or people talking about it. But I'm going to talk about it here today and hopefully I can start change. Shortly after my accident, I was informed that they were looking at either pressing criminal or uh, highway charges to the individual who caused the accident. So to start, I was not allowed an attorney for this. Um, where I live, it's no-fault insurance. And I know that there's no-fault insurance in every state and province across the world, but where I live, it's truly no-fault insurance. Meaning I can't sue another party for the damages and harm that they've caused me, or vice versa, that they can't sue me for anything. Um, I called every law firm in Manitoba to see if somebody would even speak with me and nobody would touch it because of MPI. That is the insurance that all Manitobans pay into when they start driving. So they are supposed to take care of everything. Supposed to. So the Crown was in contact with me and kind of let me know what was going to be going on um, as they move forward. Um, and that they were looking at either criminal or highway charges for this individual and that they ha there had to be some investigation going forward. So I waited and waited and finally we got closer to the date and they told me that they were only able to press highway charges. And when I asked why criminal charges weren't being looked at because of the severity of my injuries, it was said that um, under the law, there was no intent. This meaning that the man wasn't um, careless driving, wasn't reckless driving, keep that in mind moving forward. He wasn't reckless driving, that he wasn't drinking, he wasn't under the influence. There was no true intent to cause malice on the highway that day, so they could really only press highway charges. When I asked if drinking and driving, or if he was inebriated at all, or if texting records were being pulled, or phone records to see if he was texting and driving, I was told that that wouldn't happen. That the police who arrived on scene that day strongly believe that he wasn't inebriated and that he just said that he wasn't texting and driving, that the other individual admitted that he wasn't paying attention and he took fault of the, like, he took full responsibility for the accident the moment it happened. So nothing like that was taken into consideration. This other individual also got to refuse care at the scene or received um, minimal care and got to leave shortly after. And I questioned this multiple times and they just said there was no indication that they needed to investigate that further. So already there, I felt like there was some maybe missteps, I believe. I don't know. I was then told that I was allowed to make an impact statement, that I was allowed to share with the court, the judge, and that individual and his lawyer what he's done to my life and at what cost. However, there was a very clear list of things I was and was not allowed to talk about. <sighs> Which, again, so I never even got to speak my full truth that day. The only request that I had is that we did it in person. Because of COVID, we had the choice of doing it in person or over the phone. My only request was that we did it in person because I wanted to see the man who did this. Because what I know of him is only what I got to see through my broken windshield. And I will explain that as I read my impact statement. I wanted to be able to see this individual and maybe really if I could feel his remorse, then maybe I would have had some closure. Because I knew going into this, there was never going to be justice served. Because what is justice for this? There is... On one side of the coin, there is somebody who lives with unimaginable guilt for what he did. Do I believe that he feels sorry for having harmed me that day? Yes, I do. Do I believe that he tried to almost kill me? No, I don't. But there's also me. And I believe that I should matter too. Because I had a beautiful life. I am newly engaged. I am a new nurse. I had so much to offer. My life should matter too. 
So was there ever going to be justice? No. Because we would never be able to take back those four seconds. We will never be able to right this wrong. But did I hope that there was going to be some closure for me? Yes. And I believe that that closure would have came in the form of a personal apology to me from this man. But that didn't happen. So it took me about a week to write my impact statement. And it, it took a lot for me to be able to write that on paper. I also watched the dash cam footage and looked through multiple pictures of the accident. And I did that at a great personal cost to myself. Fearing that they may show that in court. And to watch that footage was something that literally took my breath away. This ripped off a bandage to a wound that's not even even begun to close yet. And it took me a long week to try to put into words what I would say to this man on the day of his sentencing. And when I gave it to the attorney, or when I gave it to the Crown, it was quickly returned because there was stuff in there that I wasn't allowed to say. So I had to rewrite it, or reword it. So then I rewrote it, reworded it, not, again, not even be able to share my full truth with this individual. And the night before court, the night before court, is when the Crown gave to me this man's apology letter, because that's when they received it, the day before court. That's when I received his apology letter. And again, I've been on every news and radio station in this province, and it took them the day before to give me their apology. I was also told at this time that this individual was allowed to have character witness. He was allowed to have individuals from his work, his family, his friends, his life, write in statements that t spoke about his character, about what a good person he was, so the judge could have an understanding of who he was as a person. And when I asked why I wasn't given the same opportunity, the same opportunity to have my friends and loved ones, my colleagues, speak to what a beautiful life that I had so the judge could better understand the change in my life, I was told, well, Miss Seawald, the sentencing is about him. It's not about you. And I feel like that is the first thing that needs to change, that the offenders in these cases are given more opportunity and rights than the victim. And I believe that that is one change that we need to make. Because I wonder, had the judge heard of the, my vibrant personality, what a beautiful and amazing caring nurse that I was, what a grand life that I lived, fully free to do what I wanted, then maybe he would understand a fraction of what this has costed me now. And I tried my best to put it into words for them, but my full truth never got to be spoken. And I believe that that can be changed. Next, it was the court day. So we, once we got to court, that is when I found out that this man didn't even show up. That he chose to do his part over the phone. He couldn't even show up to look at me in the face to tell me he was sorry for what he's done to me. And I felt like that was just like a stab in the gut that at great personal cost, I showed up. I got into a car, I drove there, and I was willing to face him willing to hear an apology if it were meaningful and truthful and heartfelt and he couldn't show up to do the same for me so I feel like that took away a bit of my closure as well the next are some facts that were said in court that I was unaware of so I was told to the court that day that when our airbags went off in our vehicles showed that I hit him going 102 kilometers an hour and that he hit me going 49 kilometers an hour, almost half the speed I was traveling on the highway. He had a very short distance from the stop sign to the yield and he hit me going half of the speed that I was going. And when I heard that, I gasped. Ryan and I kind of just looked at each other shocked. If you know the intersection where the accident occurred, you know that there's not a very long distance. And when I heard that reckless driving wasn't taken into consideration. The dash cam footage showed that there was no attempt to stop or slow to the yield signs or to the right of traffic. That also kills me hearing that. And I watched the dash cam footage and it took four seconds from him to get from the stop sign till I hit into the side of him. Four seconds that I will never get back. I 
After hearing that, it was much harder to say an impact statement that I didn't even get to say all the things that I wanted to a room that just had a judge and the crown in it and the clerk. I didn't even get to say everything I truly wanted. And I felt that that was almost ridiculous that, yep, I'm the one who has to live with unimaginable changes in my life and my life doesn't matter. That kills me. And it kills me to know that there's been a million people probably before me that this has happened to. And there will continue being people that this happened to unless we make change. Next, I was asked to say my impact statement. And I would like to share that with you guys here today. But before I read this, I would like to tell you guys what the judge told me after I was finished reading this. He said, Miss Seawald, I believe me, the crown, anyone who does this every day becomes desensitized to these cases. Three times this week already, I have dealt with uh, collision incidents where there was fatality. He's like, and I become so immune to the impact statements and the reference letters that, yes, you know, it just becomes a day of life. He was like, but I have never read an impact statement like yours. He's like, I could truly feel what you've been going through. And he was like, and I've never read anything like that. And I believe that the crown would agree to that, that I've never read an impact statement like yours. And that normally I take this stuff home to my wife and we talk about it, but I could not even share your impact statement with her because I didn't want anyone else have to read or go through what you've gone through. That kills me, knowing that my words are strong enough there and they were heard loud and clear. And this was just half of what I could say. This isn't even my full truth. And it still caused him to feel that way or to think that. And still so little was done in the end. Now I would like to read to you my impact statement. I started by saying I wish I could have seen you today as it was my only request to be able to look at you in the face as I read this. I feel like I've waited a very long time to see the man who changed my life. What I remember of you is only what I saw through my broken windshield that day. Before I begin, I would like to start by asking you a series of questions, and I hope that they resonate with you as I explain what the last eight months of my life have been like. Have you ever feared dying alone? In the most unimaginable pain that you pray and beg to whatever higher power there is, that if you are going to die alone, please at least take the pain away. Have you ever feared being trapped anywhere that was on fire? Fearing that you were going to burn alive because you were crushed in with no way out? Because I have. I have felt the clicking of my broken bones as people tried to rescue me. And have you ever feared that your life was over before it even had a chance to begin? Because I have. And those fears will haunt me every day for the rest of my life. I thought long and hard of what I would say to you here today. And it's funny because I keep saying, how will I ever be able to thank the man who saved my life that day? How will we ever be able to put into words what John did for me and the gratitude that me and my family have for him for saving me? Never once thinking about what I would say to you though, the man who almost killed me. How will I ever be able to put into words what you have caused me and my family? And how will I ever be able to find the words big enough to describe what you have done to my life? Find the words to describe how a four-second lapse in judgment would determine the rest of my life. Seemingly, it is much harder to find the words to say to you here today. I know that we lived very different experiences that day. And while you walked away virtually unscathed, I was airlifted out, too unstable to be transported by Grand Ambulance. And I would like to walk you through my experiences that day and hope that you see the importance of what four seconds of careless driving can look like on the highway and that you never make the same mistake twice again. On August 17th, I was on my way home from a night shift, excited to shower, rest, see my then boyfriend, now fiance. And I remember thinking what a gorgeous day it was out and how I could not wait to go for a walk or bike ride later when Ryan got home from work. Sadly and unknowingly, I would not see outside for the next month as I laid in a hospital bed in excruciating pain. I want to start by saying that I remember every excruciating moment that came next. And it is important to me that you know that. That I was lucid the entire time. 
My body in too much shock to fall unconscious for my injuries or to have a moment of peace. I remember, and I would like to share what that was like for me. I remember coming down the highway and seeing your truck and thinking, oh my God, he is coming in there too quickly. Please be turning into the left-hand lane. Oh my God, he's not stopping. The stop process happened in about three seconds before I collided into the side of your truck. I did not even have time to attempt to break or save myself. The moments immediately after impact are some of the most painful and terrifying moments I've ever experienced in my life. The pain ripping through me like a thousand knives, unable to catch my breath, trying to scream for help but no words would come. I thought my car was on fire because of the smell and the smoke. I know now it was the airbags, but at the time, I was terrified, unable to breathe, pain ripping me apart. I frantically tried to escape, fearing I was going to burn alive in there if I did not try to get out. Realizing then where one of my legs was, and that it was behind me. Realizing where the dash was, and realizing then, even if I wanted to escape, I would not be able to. I was crushed in there. And it was at this moment that I just looked up at my broken windshield. And I begged, Papa, please don't let me die alone in here. And if I am dying, please take the pain away. Because the pain was unbearable and something I will remember every day for the rest of my life. Immediately after that, John got into the back of my car to help stabilize me. But even in those moments of complete fear and pain, I would like you to know something. That my first question when John got in the back of my vehicle was how you were doing. Is the other person okay? Are they hurt? Are they alive? Is somebody helping them too? I asked about you before I was even concerned with myself. Grabbing my head and stabilizing my C-spine, desperately trying to calm me, John told me that you were okay and walking by my car. And that is the only image I've had of you over the last eight months. John helping me to self-triage so EMS had a better understanding of what they were working with. And being a nurse, I was able to tell him that my lower back or pelvis must be broken because the pain is unbearable. My belly was getting rigid, so if it is my pelvis, that means I'm probably bleeding internally. That I can hardly breathe. So I've either broken ribs, maybe a pneumothorax, or even both, Consider how close I was to the dash. Thinking that this was the worst of my injuries, not even knowing that the worst was yet to come. John's next question will sit with me for as long as I live. He asked me if I could feel my legs. That was the moment I realized, no, I cannot. I remember thinking it took so long for EMS to offer assistance, that there were so many people around, but only John was there helping me. And that was the worst feeling begging for help and having to wait for them to assess the scene, having to wait for the fire department to get the jaws of life, the waiting, sitting there in the most unimaginable pain. I remember seeing my phone out of the corner of my eye and I grabbed it, trying to call Ryan. Certain it would be the last time I would speak with him. Finally, they shattered the driver's side window and I remember the fresh air hitting me like a brick, glass raining over me. And after getting the door open, I remember EMS saying, I'm sorry, Brianna, there's no easy way to do this. We just have to try to pull you out now. The second they began trying to move me, the pain was so severe, I screamed and I begged for them to stop, knowing that they couldn't. And as they pulled me out over the spinal board, I felt the clicking of my lower spine, knowing then it was broken. After this, I lost sensation from chest down, succumbing to the multiple injuries along my spine. Now there's this brief moment I wish to tell you about. This moment when they began extricating me, when everything became quiet. A moment of peaceful calm fell over me like a warm blanket. And I remember thinking, that's it. I'm dying now. Coming around to a paramedic firmly, sternal rubbing me, telling me I needed to stay awake. I needed to stay with them and I could not close my eyes. In the back of the ambulance, hearing them say stars needed to land on the highway, that I was too unstable for ground transport. I remember the stars ride. I remember arriving at HSC, and I remember the team working on me, being so terrified that I was going to die before someone could get a hold of my mom, dad, or Ryan. Then finally being told after multiple tests and scans, Brianna, you have broken your neck. You're back in multiple places. You dissected an artery in your neck. It's likely that you have a pneumothorax. You have broken ribs multiple soft tissue injuries and that I likely had sustained spinal shock from the multiple traumas along my spine and that is why I cannot feel anything from chest down. 
Ryan arrived shortly after this and they told him the severity of my injuries. Thinking again, the worst was over. I was informed I needed to be placed into a halo stabilization device to stabilize my neck because surgical intervention would be too difficult with the severity of the break and my artery dissection. And that spinal fusion at this level would result in complete loss of function of my neck for the rest of my life and would be a last resort. I was fully conscious fully aware, not frozen or sedated, when they drilled four screws into my skull. Six full-grown men held and stabilized me as they began one of the most excruciating things that I've ever experienced, which is a lot considering I had just broken my spine in six places. They held me down as they screwed the pins in. I screamed and begged for them to stop, Ryan standing at the foot of the bed begging for them to sedate me because none of the pain medication was working. It was explained that traditionally the patient sits at 90 degrees while the halo is placed, but given the nature and the severity of my other back injuries, this would not be possible. And that because I would be laying down for halo placement, I would need to be conscious to help engage my shoulder muscles and scowl to help them avoid my facial muscles and nerves. I was conscious for all four of those screws being secured into my skull until they could finally sedate me and let me have a moment of rest. I finally came to three days later in such pain a special team of pain doctors was assigned to my case to help control it. The medication made me violently ill and I aspirated on my own vomit on more than one occasion because I could not sit up and I had no use of my arms or hands to even call for help. I knew then that I was in for the fight of my life, that every single thing I knew from my life before was going to be a challenge moving forward and that nothing would be the same. I was unable to bathe or toilet myself for months. Loss of bowel and bladder control at the age of 27 is humiliating. I went from being an independent 27-year-old to needing full, round-the-clock care. The humiliation of needing someone to help clean me and change me because I can no longer bend to do so myself. Having to carry spare clothes in case handicap accessible washrooms are unavailable. Having to beg and appeal an insurance company for all the basic necessities that come after an accident like this. My fiancé washed me in salad bowls for almost two months before proper equipment was even provided. Bed baths, excruciating turns and repositions to prevent bed sores on parts of my body I can no longer feel. The infections from having a foreign body screwed into my head for four and a half months. The many terrifying doctor's appointments that I needed to be sedated for because the thought of ever getting back into a vehicle is more than I can bear. This accident has resulted in clinically diagnosed PTSD which haunts my life daily. The nightmares, the pain, the not being able to open my eyes while I'm in a car needing therapy to help control the panic attacks and terror that I feel daily. The flashbacks of that day are just as vivid as the moment they happened and all the same traumatizing. I can't even hear the sounds of sirens without having severe panic attacks because I associate that sound with dying. And how will I ever be able to return to my job as a nurse if I cannot hear the sound of a siren? I sleep alone in the middle of our living room in a hospital bed and I have for the last eight months as I cannot yet sleep in a regular bed. My back injuries and abdominal injuries prevent this from happening as I cannot roll over in a regular bed without the assistance of the mechanical bed. Our bedroom is inaccessible, so when the nightmares of you driving out in front of me keep me up at night, I do not even have the comfort of my fiancé by my side. I have not slept soundly through the night since August 17th, 2020. I have been engaged for the past seven months. Ryan proposed to me while I was in the hospital. And while this is an endearing gesture and story to the world, it is heartbreaking to know that he only proposed then, fearing I might die without ever knowing how much he truly loved me. I have not been held or slept in the same bed as my fiancé in eight months. I could not even be hugged for those first four and a half months while I was in the halo. Ryan was and has been my caregiver for the past eight months, and instead of dates, walks in the park, movies on the couch, bike rides, or planning our wedding, he has learned to be my home care nurse, how to wash, toilet, transfer, and care for me. He takes care of the house, me, and still goes to work full time, a workload far too much for anyone to keep up with, I fear. I used to daydream about my wedding, fantasize about it, and what little girl doesn't? Said now I am forced to watch and help plan my loved ones, my friends, plan their own weddings because I cannot even plan my own. I get asked every day, when's my wedding? Have you started planning your wedding yet? Have you picked out a dress? 
And I cannot even think of my wedding because it kills me to do so. Because the thought of not being able to walk with my father and mother down my wedding aisle or dance with my husband at my wedding is more than I can bear. I dreamed of being a beautiful bride. Now I am scarred head to toe, bald spots where my hair once was. And how will I ever be able to pick out a dress or a veil long enough to cover the flaws that you created? Will I need a spare dress in case I have an accident? A dress loose enough to cover incontinent products, but also simple enough that I won't get run over in my wheelchair. Will I be too sore from the chronic pain I now feel to even enjoy my wedding? Because these are the things I think when people ask me about my wedding. And while this accident has affected my personal life greatly, I also wish to tell you how it has affected other aspects of my life as well. I do not know if you know this, but I was a new nurse. Two weeks shy of working a full year the day I crashed into you. I often say nursing is who I am and not what I do. My mother has pictures of me playing doctor at the age of four with my cousins on my grandma's living room floor. Nursing was my dream. It took me six long years to finally make my dream a reality where it takes others maybe two or four. I worked multiple jobs to help support myself and my family through nursing school. It was not an easy road, but hard work always pays off, and I graduated valedictorian on the dean's list at the top of my class with academic merit and honors. The dean and my professor spoke to the nurse I would be, the compassion, the knowledge, and the dedication that I would bring to the profession, that I would have a long, beautiful career in which many lives I would touch. I only got to be a nurse for 11 and a half months, and knowing if or how I will ever be able to return, and if I can, at what capacity. And it kills me every time someone says, you can be a nurse still, but maybe as telehealth or triage desk job. I was born to do this job. And there have been many families who have reached out to me since this accident who have heard of what happened. To tell me that I made a difference in their lives and their loved ones' lives. That the care that I gave them was unmatched. That it was remarkable. And that I really made a difference. I loved my job more than anything. I belong in bedside nursing. I did not become a nurse for an office or a desk job. I could have been an extra set of hands they desperately needed in this pandemic. I belong in the ER saving lives. I belong in the war treating illness, bandaging wounds, and comforting people in their last breaths. But you have taken this from me, a career I so long for and a dream I worked tirelessly to obtain, ripped away from me from your four-second error. COVID has made this process especially difficult. My own mother and father could not come see me when I arrived at HSC after the accident and would not see me until I was transported to Steinbeck Hospital. Ryan never missed a day by my side, but to go through something this traumatic and not be allowed to be comforted by your own parents, siblings, or loved ones is impossible. The isolation and loneliness this has brought to my life is suffocating. I was an outgoing, active person, and now I am confined to a wheelchair in the living room of my house as it is the only accessible room in my house. I fear I am being left behind and forgotten. My friends have small get-togethers when it is safe to do so, and I am no longer invited because I am not accessible. I cannot go to homes with stairs. I cannot sit outside for extended, for extended periods of time because the cold aches my broken bones to the core. I am a burden, and I will not be asked to go to the beach, to go camping, hiking, swimming, biking. I will not be asked to participate because I simply cannot. How heartbreaking is it to know the life that I worked so hard for? The life that I truly loved is no more. I have touched on the physical implications of this accident, but to sit and explain them in detail will take me a lifetime as I will live with them for a lifetime. I broke my neck at C2 with bone fragmentation, a complicated hangman's fracture, my spine at T1, T2, T11, L1, L2, and my sacral spine throughout. I broke ribs on my left-handed side, left side of pneumothorax, soft tissue abdominal injuries, left knee injury, paralysis of lower limb with severe sensory deficits bilaterally, weakness in arms, debilitating vertigo as a result of inner ear damage, eyesight damage as a result of severe concussion, balance and proprioception problems, jaw and teeth damage. I was in the hospital for 37 days, though I was supposed to stay there for an approximate 60 more. They were hoping to rehabilitate me enough to the point of doing stairs so I could go home. 
but it was very clear that this was an unrealistic goal as it would likely not happen. My first three weeks in hospital were excruciating, as mentioned. It took weeks before they could get my pain managed and the vomiting to stop. I went from only ever taking Tylenol to taking the strongest narcotics a human can have. Multiple IVs and sets of tubing attached to me. At one point, I was on IV ketamine, IV hydromorph, IV fentanyl, IV halidol, IV gravol, IV maxran, IV electrolytes, and IV fluids all at once. Four IV sites with wide tubing to help to connect the multiple IV lines to me. But my veins kept collapsing under the strains of these medications, and I received so many IVs they no longer had IV access, and a pick line was considered. The needles were endless. I now take 22 pills a day to calm the symptoms associated with my injuries. I have tremors and am spastic from the nerve injuries and damage. I have lost the feeling to parts of my body. I have violent vertigo attacks that make me vomit. I am in constant pain every day. Every single day. The nerves that misfire and ache, the crawling under my skin from the damaged nerves. I am incontinent at times. Some days I cannot even leave my bed as a result of the pain or the symptoms that cannot be controlled. The infections at my pin sites that cause even worse scarring. And the scars are never ending. Every time I take off my clothes and I look in the mirror, I cry. A constant reminder of what you did to me that day. A constant reminder of the trauma my body endured. My hair fell out in clumps and now I am left to cover the bald spots with the remaining hair. And the scar is so deep that even makeup will not cover. A revolving door of doctor's appointments and follow-ups. I've had over 40 sets of films in the last eight months of my broken bones. The constant threat of needing spinal fusion because the bones were not healing as they should have. I've had physio two times a week, but I missed out on actual physio in a clinic with adequate equipment because I had to have home physio as I was unable to travel to the clinic with my halo or while my neck was still broken. It took seven long, painful months for my neck to heal before I could even travel to the clinic. This only further set back my recovery. These are the appointments I've already had. I've seen a neurosurgeon multiple times, my GP multiple times, ophthalmology twice, stroke prevention twice, prosthodontist three times, family dentist twice. Still to come are audiology to correct the vertigo, which may not work, resulting in lifelong vertigo. Orthodontics to correct the injuries to my jaw. Ophthalmology to see if my eyes are correcting. If not, I will see a neuro ophthalmologist to see if the results are more severe than they initially thought. MRI of my left leg to determine if the injuries require surgery now or further down the line. Neurology to assess the level of injuries and to assess the loss of sensation to my lower extremities and the deficits to my body. A series of testing that needs to be done. The physical injuries of this accident will last a lifetime. And when I asked my neurosurgeon about my excruciating back pain that I still have, said given the severity of the breaks and the compression of them, most people experience chronic pains with these types of injuries. At the age of 27, I now take more medication to get through my day than most people take in a lifetime. I've been asked to talk about the financial impact that this accident has had on me and my fiance's life. I think there's a huge misconception that MPI has and will cover all of my needs moving forward since this accident. Unfortunately, Ryan and I have already experienced and learned the hard way that this is not the case. The financial burden has only just begun and it's only been eight months. We needed a wheelchair accessible vehicle to refinance our home. My house is my house is inaccessible and MPI will only repair on a case to case basis. And because my house is inaccessible, I have already destroyed the door frames, the paint down the hallway, the bottoms of the cabinets in the kitchen and the bathroom. They drilled through the tile on our stairs and it is unknown if they will repair them at this time. And if I want access to my full basement, it will also be at our own cost. And a stair lift is $4,000. So far, this is the list of the costs we have already encountered, and I fear this is only the beginning. The SUV was $48,000. Mortgage refinancing was $1,200. Accessible clothing while I was in my halo made by my family and loved ones was $150. And the accessible bed is almost $10,000. House repairs not limited to new doors, paint, baseboards, tile, and landing approximately $3,000. Stair lift to basement, $4,000. Massage therapy, as MPI does not cover massage therapy, is $85 an hour, and it was estimated I would need it two times a week. A handsicle, so maybe I can enjoy the outdoors and return to some normalcy, $3,000. Orthodontics for jaw and teeth realignment after the accident, approximately $8,000. Second folding wheelchair, $950. Spinal rehab is $100 an hour for two to four hours, five times a week, plus the Regina trip for the initial assessment. Hotel is $110 a night, times six nights is $660. Gas amount unknown, food cost unknown. Therapy, 
Um, actual therapy for the assessment is approximately $90 an hour for 10 hours, so it's $900. FES pads for the therapy machines is $50. And now spinal rehab in Winnipeg would be two to four hours, five days a week, at $100 an hour. That's $2,000 a week, $8,000 a month. These are just the cost of the things we know now, and I fear that they will only keep accumulating. Ryan has missed six months of work to stay home with me. The caregiver allowance for MPI is minimum wage only, and only up to an assessed amount, which is decreased every time I could move more than my arms. All the costs are in case-to-case -case need, and MPI assesses and awards on the bare minimum to restore functionality of life. At any point, MPI may wish to stop therapy for my PTSD that was the result of this accident. At any time, MPI can deny coverage for any of my requests for needs or necessities to help make my life easier or to restore my life to as close to the life as I had before. Dealing with MPI has caused more stress to an already stressful situation. Every single thing I need now to live my life needs to be asked for and can be denied. I spoke about needing to be washed in salad bowls, but how about when I first was to come home? An MPI solution to me needing full round-the-clock care was to put me in a diaper with snacks on a bedside table until a home care provider could come and tend to me. When explained that I was incontinent at times, I could not get to my wheelchair to go to the bathroom, and even if I could do, I would not have the strength to move my chair. They said that's what the brief was for. I was to be left sitting in my own filth, no better than the family dog, and that is why Ryan had to stay home with me. This accident has completely stripped me of my dignity. I, we have inquired about spinal rehab, as I did not receive adequate spinal rehab from the start. I have been in contact with First Steps Wellness in Winnipeg, the leader in spinal rehab in our country, giving me the best chance of being able to walk again. I was denied instant approval by MPI and had to send a formal proposal that would go to a board and has yet to be determined. Generally, MPI does not pay for this type of rehab. I have to beg for the chance to have proper and adequate rehab, and how ridiculous is that? that I have to ask and beg for all the things that were taken away from me by no fault of my own. Literally beg for the fighting chance to be able to walk again. And every day since this accident has been a fight for basic necessities. I have gained a large following on social media, been on every news and radio station in our province. I have become a role model to millions sharing my story. And had there been equal opportunity, there would have been 410,000 followers. Over 30,000 community and surrounding community members, thousands of family and friends, co-workers to speak on my character. To speak on the vibrant, big, beautiful life that I had that you took away from me. And the positivity and grace I've carried myself with. Never once have I spoke ill of you or the company you work for, even though you ironically hit me in a truck that said, How's my driving on the back? My only hope in sharing my story was to help others and bring awareness to highway safety. Maybe show the world what positivity can bring after an impossible tragedy. Give hope to others in a similar situation. I have done my best to handle this situation with as much grace as I possibly could. Put on my best brave face and been grateful for all I still have. However, I wish I did not have to be brave or courageous. That I didn't need to be thankful for the minimally functional life I still have. And that just because I am strong enough to deal with this pain doesn't mean that I should have to. But I have no choice anymore, and I want just for a moment to be selfish and to be greedy here in this room today and to remember the big, beautiful, wonderful, fulfilled life that I lived before. I waited eight months for an apology from you. Eight months for recognition on what you've done to my life. Maybe if there had even been an attempt at acknowledging what you've put me through, I would have been able to sleep more soundly. I sat for months wondering if you've even acknowledged what you've done to my life, if you've even considered what I've been through. An apology or an attempt at an apology would have meant much more if it came long before this date. And I will remind you again that I was concerned about you the moment that we crashed. And it is not in my nature to wish ill on anyone. I do not even wish that the roles were reversed because I simply do not wish this on my worst enemy. You've had a chance to live your life, get married, my life has only just begun. Now a constant worry if I will ever walk again, if I will be able to plan and have my wedding, if I will return to my career, if the constant pain I feel will ever end, will I ever be able to run and play with my future children? I will think of this and what you've done to me every day for the rest of my life. Will you? I have wished every day since that day that I would have just stayed
stayed at work for a few extra minutes, laughing with one of my work friends. Just enjoyed that moment. If I even just waited four seconds longer, I would not have been on the highway with him that day. Four seconds changed my life. And I would give it anything to have those moments back. He ultimately was charged with careless driving, resulting in a fine of $1,000 and restitution to be paid into the amount of $2,000 to me. A $3,000 fine. And he will never have to think of me again. He will never have to think about what he's done to my life. And I said from the start, I never wanted somebody else's life to be ruined from a four second decision. But I've had months to sit with this now and my life is ruined. For a moment, I wanted my life to matter somewhere. For my life to be acknowledged because it is not recognized by the insurance company and it wasn't recognized in that room that day. So there was no closure. I wanted to be more than just a statistic and unfortunately, this happens more often than not. The penalty is much less than what is deserved. And that's the change that needs to happen. There needs to be harsher penalties for these kinds of things. Harsher penalties for careless driving. It should be taken just as seriously as driving recklessly or speeding and driving. Because if you can admittedly cause an accident causing bodily harm or death of another human being because you chose not to pay attention, you chose not to pay attention. That's not an accident. That is a choice you make. And people should be held accountable for those decisions and those choices. Not a thousand dollar fine or not a slap on the wrist. That teaches people nothing. And maybe that is why the judge had three other cases of highway fatalities in one week. Three other cases before mine that week. Maybe it's a general correlation between the penalties and, you know, accidents. Maybe the penalties aren't harsh enough and that is the reason why. Because nobody is being held accountable. Nobody has to second think, second guess before they get in the vehicle. And there's millions of people that do every year. But all it takes is that one person for four seconds to decide, yep, I'm going to speed across here today. I'm not going to look both ways before crossing the street. Four seconds can kill or ruin somebody's life. And that should be thought about. And we need to make a change. Because this is not an isolated case. Because everybody you talk to. Everybody listening to this right now has been affected by a car accident some way. Whether it's indirectly or directly, whether it's your own family or friends of family or someone that you love or friends or colleagues, you will know somebody who has gone through this exact same thing. And I never thought that it would be me, so I never thought to care about it. But I'm asking all of Manitobans to start caring about it because it could be you. In four seconds, it could be you. And instead of the campaign, part of the 100, what about part of the four seconds? Because I'm part of those four seconds and we need to make a change.